first, they lost Nagorno Karabakh to Azerbaijan. Now, Armenia's leaders are struggling for survival as people go to the polls in early general elections. So, how will last year's war shape the vote? And can the outcome end the political crisis in Armenia? This is Inside Story. Welcome to Inside Story with me, Sahil Rahman. On Sunday, Armenians will vote in a second parliamentary snap election in less than three years. Four political blocs and 22 parties are going up against caretaker Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan, who stepped down in April following months of protests demanding his resignation. Many call him a traitor for signing a peace deal that ended six weeks of fighting in Nagorno Karabakh, but returned swathes of territory to Armenia's long standing rival, Azerbaijan. Four former leaders are running in Sunday's vote, including Robert Kocharyan, who's seen as an opposition frontrunner. Roy Challenge reports now from Yerevan on what's been described as the most competitive elections in Armenia's modern history. This election should not be happening for another two years, and there's only one reason why it is, and that is Armenia's devastating defeat last year in a conflict with Azerbaijan and its allies, Turkey, over the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh. Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan thought that the only way out of the ensuing political crisis was to call early elections. There are a dizzying array of candidates, some 26 different parties and blocs, but basically it boils down to a two-horse race between Pashinyan and his main rival, the former president, Robert Kocharyan. Now, you might think that any prime minister who lost such a devastating and humiliating war would be political history. And the polls are tight, almost neck and neck. But most of the people that we've been speaking to here, the analysts, are expecting Nicole Pashinyan to win. Now, uh, Kocharyan is trying to rally uh, uh, and galvanize the anti-Pashinyan vote. But regardless of who wins this uh, election, the challenges that face the victor are daunting. There is a traumatized nation. There is economics. There is development. There is security. Yes, an election might solve some of these issues, but it's certainly going to be no panacea. Well, let's take a look at recent key developments in the lead up to the election. Last November, a Russian brokered ceasefire ended the six week conflict between Azeri and ethnic Armenian forces in the enclave of Nagorno Karabakh. The deal locked in territorial gains for Azerbaijan. In January, Russian President Vladimir Putin hosted the first post war talks between the leaders of Azerbaijan and Armenia. Analysts say Russia's peacekeepers thwarted a stronger military presence from Turkey that backs Azerbaijan. And in April, Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan stepped down over criticism of his handling of the conflict. He said he wants to return power to the people so they can decide the government's future through free and fair elections. And last week, Baku handed over 15 prisoners of war in exchange for a map detailing the location of landmines in a region ceded by Armenia. But tensions remain in Nagorno-Karabakh with sporadic fighting between Azerbaijani and Armenian troops. Well, let's bring in our guest for this edition of Inside Story from Yerevan, Harut Manugian, who's an election systems consultant for Transparency International Armenia. And from Moscow, Vladimir Sonitkov, a political scientist at the Russian Academy of Sciences. And Arsen Haratyan is a, an Armenian analyst and former advisor to the Armenian Prime Minister, Nikol Pashinyan. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. Uh, Harut Manungian, can I come to you first, sir? Um, how much of this election is about the aftermath of the recent conflict with Azerbaijan? And how much is it about the issues of the economy, education and health care? Uh, I should say it's all about uh, the aftermath uh, of the conflict with Azerbaijan. Uh, so after the ceasefire agreement was signed on the night of November 9th, uh, immediately protests began even that night. Uh, in fact, there were some uh, instances of violence uh, with government buildings being broken into. Uh, and those protests continued afterwards uh, for several months. And uh, really the trigger was an announcement uh, in March, uh, or sorry, in late February, 
uh, where senior military officials uh, had joined calls for the resignation of the prime minister. And so this early election, so this is uh, ahead of the normal five-year term yeah. uh, for Armenian, uh, Armenia's parliamentary elections. And uh, the reason this early election was called was basically uh, to uh, get a new mandate uh, for the Nikol Pashinyan civil contract party uh, government. Uh, and so we'll find out tomorrow if, if that will be... Indeed, we will find that out. But, you know, without giving it, we'll go into all of this in more detail. I mean, in terms of the lead up, up to the war, was there satisfaction, in your opinion, uh, Mr. Manunan, that Mr. Pashinyan was doing a good job or was there always discontent since the start and, and continuation of the Velvet Revolution? Uh, I would say leading up almost to the very end of the war, uh, uh, there was wide satisfaction with the results of the Velvet Vel Revolution. There was wide satisfaction with anti-corruption uh, reforms that had been taking place. There was an electoral reform process in which I was personally involved uh, for the last two years. Uh, and uh, really, it was, uh, it was the result of this war that okay. kind of broke the back of that process. Uh, Arsen Haratyan in Washington, D.C., your man very close to uh, the... Prime Minister, as he as he sits for the time being, as the the stand-in until the elections are, are concluded, um, what's your general impression of the situation of the country uh, up to this particular point? And Mr. Pashinyan's um, not just behaviour, but his record up to now, from bringing the people with him to now having a large majority of them not so supportive. Thank you. Thank you for having me uh, on Inside Story. Uh, I, before I get to the question which relates to uh, our previous speaker, I would actually like to disagree with uh, dear Hart uh, on whether there was a wide satisfaction. I mean, uh, we're all part of the civil society also, and we've been following how slowly the real fundamental reforms were taking place, or no reforms were taking place. And this not, didn't necessarily have to do with uh, the political will. I believe that the, pre the, the Pashinyan administration did have the political will, but uh, the, the realities are that uh, on no er serious area, like the judiciary reform, like the vetting of the judges, like many other areas of the security forces, police, and other areas, we haven't seen actually much of the reform. And that actually created a lot of the, uh, I would say, at least discontent. Discontent might be a strong word, but a lot of uh, uh, the concerns among uh, especially civil society players, especially those who have been very active in pushing forward the reform agenda. Okay. Though uh, the several factors definitely uh, played in uh, both internal and external. Um, a lot of the problems with the, the fake news, the medias uh, that did not exist, that are owned by a lot of the previous regimes, uh, but also, of course, uh, larger players, both regional and global, um, uh, with not much engagement with the people or groups that might be and the forefront of the reform agenda from the outside players, uh, and of course, democracy spoilers that have been uh, pretty much uh, spo trying to, um, uh, I would say, uh, disqualify the results or the very, uh, the very fact of the revolution of 2018. If there, if there was uh, this discontent, if I can just get in there, Mr. Harit Yan, before, uh, you know, because obviously there's other, we want to try and uh, expand the, the conversation. If there was that much discontent, was that just another reason um, for the way, you might say, other groups such as the military, uh, civil service, were, it, were not very happy with the way the government were performing and this was an underbelly, a chance for outside forces to do what they did? Uh, no, I, I would still agree with Harut that uh, the, the reason why these elections are happening is really the war, the devastating war that we had last year, the aggression by Azerbaijan and Turkey with Islamist mercenaries fighting against Armenians in Karabakh. And this was definitely uh, the, the largest, uh, I mean, one thing we have to realize is that the Karabakh conflict, as much as we want to um, uh, talk about it or not, has been instrumental in shaping up the new identity of uh, current day Armenia. And uh, I think the realization of how important it is to address Karabakh conflict in order to be able to move forward, I don't think was fully realized. Okay. Uh, but, but the military and the behavior by different government agencies was not directly linked to what the Pashinyan administration was doing. It was, of course, also the result of the war, but also the issues with regards to good governance, a promise that was given in 2018, the good governance, governance in general mm. as uh, an institutional approach and as a reform agenda that I don't believe has been uh, really addressed properly. Okay. Uh
Vladimir Sotnikov in Moscow, I think analysts not just in Moscow but globally would be very interested in what's going on uh, in the Caucasus right now. How is Moscow, in terms of viewing uh, what's going on right now, uh, reacting, maybe not right now, they will react, I'm sure, after the, the result itself, but how have they been reacting to Armenia's plight in the last 12 months and what it's had to go through? Thank you very much for having me in this show, Inside Story. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, what I would like to say uh, before answering fully your question is that uh, from the very first of um, days of the last conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, or Armenia and Azerbaijan, whatever, uh, Moscow was standing for uh, the integrity of Armenia. Integrity of Armenia and Moscow actually uh, had brokered a very good deal, uh, the ceasefire between, uh, between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. And, uh, so, and it's very important uh, for Moscow to have uh, a peaceful neighbor, neighbor in the Caucasus. And uh, Moscow also would like to see more stable relationship with Armenia, whatever the results would be on uh, tomorrow's election. It... Another thing uh, which I would like to, to, to note is, uh, sorry, sorry, I just uh, took my part. Okay, uh, and another thing which Moscow would like to see it is because it doesn't have any preferences for any candidate. But I would like to say that uh, the acting prime minister in the past made some uh, anti uh, Kremlin, anti Moscow sentiments, and uh, that's why the attitude, the general attitude uh, at the Kremlin is uh, uh, a piece of mistrust uh, uh, to the um, uh, present authorities of uh, Armenia. Indeed. Uh, let's go back to Harut Manunyan uh, in uh, Yerevan. Obviously, you know, the big question is whether Pashishian, uh, Pashishian can actually hold on to power when there are many of you might say the old guard and those as uh, even Mr Sotnikov perhaps uh, alluded to that there may be some in uh, Armenian politics that favour a much more closer relationship with Russia. Uh, and this is going to be the real dilemma for the voters on Sunday. Uh, certainly, uh, of the 25 political parties that have been registered in the election, and obviously only a few of them will make it into parliament, uh, really the consensus is that uh, Armenia doesn't really have uh, alternatives available uh, other than a strategic partnership uh, with Russia. Uh, as Vladimir mentioned, uh, certainly uh, Pashinyan represents uh, this concept of uh, a color revolution type of uh, movement. However, the reality is that after the war, uh, he's firmly, uh, e even before the war, the, the question of Armenia's participation in the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, the Collective C uh, Security Treaty Organization, these, these never came under question. Um, and sort of there is this uh, consensus that Armenia will be working with Russia. And frankly, as a result of the war, a lot of Armenians saw the tepid response uh, from uh, European and, and North American partners during the war. And, and they saw that uh, there, is, there is not going to be a possibility to rely on them in the, in the security sphere. And currently, there are real threats. Uh, there's our Azerbaijani soldiers have uh, crossed the border uh, into the Republic That's... of Armenia. I, I believe the last number was there was about a thousand troops uh, several kilometers into the the borders of uh, uh, the uh, that's something that we will, I think, touch upon. I think later in the program. I think we just want to focus just on the election first, because then geopolitics sure. obviously fits into that very, very neatly. Arsen Haratian in Washington D.C. For the electorate in Armenia, is this a choice between sort of arrogance and corruption of the past versus, you might say, the politically naive and the reckless nature of the current administration? Is there a real choice for the electorate in Armenia on Sunday? I think uh, the polls that we've been following have shown it, and I think over 40 percent, nearing 50 percent of the people are undecided. And I think that um, it's uh, choosing between uh, basically the two evils right now for many people that I know. Um, it is also about giving a second chance to Pashinyan. And I don't know how much of that is going to happen. The polls, the poll results will show that the elections will show tomorrow. I really hope that the elections will be conducted in the best uh, possible transparent way, and this is a key thing for democracy in Armenia and for Pashinyan administration to begin with. No administrative resources being used. Uh, we've been following different processes already, but the big, 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 big picture will be more visible tomorrow. And I do hope that there will be no post-election uh, negative developments. I would 
have to uh, state here that uh, probably since the 90s, this is the first time when Armenia will have really the most unpredictable elections. Nobody can really say what the outcomes of the elections will be. But I do really want to touch upon a point uh, by Vladimir, by our colleague in Moscow, who is saying that, well, yeah, Russia doesn't, or Moscow doesn't really um, have any favorites. Yes, directly, Vladimir Putin or others in the Kremlin are not showing any uh, favoritism, but pro-Kremlin hybrid media organizations mm. have been demonizing this administration for years now, number one. Number two, I agree that there may be some sentiments that can be considered as anti-Kremlin by Pashinyan. I believe that this is uh, mostly because of a lack of experience. There have been mistakes made, but there have also been fundamental decisions that have been made, like, for example, right after the revolution, sending Armenian doctors and deminers to Syria which was not happening before. Yeah. On the bigger picture, I think that Pashinyan uh, he himself, in the rhetoric or by making mistakes, he might have, uh, uh, the, it, in a way, degraded the relations with Moscow. But I think, in general, within the Armenian public, because of what happened as a, as a result of this war, how Russia behaved in this war, yes, it did come in at some point after 44 days to broker a deal, an announcement that stopped the bloodshed, but it also did not really come to the expectation levels of the Armenian people, where the strategic partnership for over three decades now with Russia were expected to, to, to gain much more, to have a different level of engagement that at least the perception of the Armenian public had. So I think in mm -hmm. general, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop in a sec, in general, there is a lot that is being discussed within the Armenian public. And I think that one thing that we should be very careful about is that Armenia and the Armenians in Armenia did not really have anti-Russian sentiments. So the Putin Kremlin should be very careful in going deeper in creating those sentiments that I don't think is going to result in anything positive. Well, I know Mr. Manukin is nodding and agreeing, but I want to go back to Vladimir uh, Sotnikov in Moscow because it does suit perhaps Russia's uh, needs right now to have a neighbour that is slightly pro-Moscow but also has been democratically elected in a world at the moment where democracy and the issue of democracy is so hotly debated, especially when it comes around elections. This is sort of a win-win for Moscow, really, isn't it? Yes, it is, actually. <laughs> Kremlin doesn't have anything against the democratic, the truly democratic elections, actually. Now, uh, more, I would like to say that, uh, uh, to my mind, uh, um, Vladimir Putin, the Russian leader, actually, don't want to hear any aggravation of Armenian situation after the results of the election. You know, we, we actually, we, we stand for uh, the matter that uh, uh, whatever the results will be, uh, we will have to see what will be the attitude of uh, uh, the uh, Armenian, the new or the old Armenian authorities uh, to the development of relations uh, with uh, Russia and uh, between uh, between the elected leader of Armenian people and uh, between a Russian president or whoever will be in power in Russia. So I would like to say that uh, my prediction is that uh, probably in the second tour of election, uh, I it seems to me just regularly that uh, Robert Kocharan would win. But it doesn't mean that doesn't mean that uh, uh, Nikola Pashinyan. Uh, could take uh, could take all uh, could take the necessary amount of votes and he will be again the leader of Armenia. So despite all these uh, uh, elections, I mean this is very important for Armenian yeah. people. And I would like to say that um, Russia actually uh, traditionally I agree with my American esteemed uh, um, colleague uh, that Russia traditionally all always supported the Armenian cause, the, the, the Armenia, and mm -hmm. all the problems with Nagorno-Karabakh, this is the inher they, they inherited from the Soviet past, the Bolshevik past. So okay. actually, I think that uh, for, for, for Moscow, uh, whatever the choice of the Armenian people will be, Moscow would like to develop good and stable, uh, and probably, uh, again, strategic partnership with uh, with new or uh, old authorities of Armenia. Thank you. OK. Um, let's bring in Harut um, Anugian back in, in Yerevan. I mean, uh, one of the candidates that's up for the election is Robert uh, Kocharian, uh, as mentioned by my colleague Rory Challens, president between, what, 98 to 2008. He heads the Armenia bloc. Um, he's pro-Moscow, uh, but also he ha had a very interesting statement. He said that he wanted to rebuild national security and regain lost territories. It sounds like he might want to go to war or might, to start, or might want to start controversy again. Is that a real concern to, to you uh, uh, as, a, as an Armenian uh, and to maybe some people in the electorate? 
so uh, one of the slogans, probably a quasi-official slogan of the Armenia Alliance that Robert Kocharyan leads, uh, is everything is going to be okay. Uh, and the implication of that, although although it, it was the first uh, president of Armenia who's also running in this election, Levon Terperosyan said that uh, Kocharyan's statement implied uh, a restart of the war. Uh, Kocharyan was uh, heavily involved in the negotiate in the peace negotiations uh, during his tenure. Uh, his his implication that he is uh, saying with that statement is that uh, I have uh, the standing to negotiate the return of the uh, Hadrut and Shushi uh, areas, uh, which were part of the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, autonomous oblast during Soviet times, but are now under uh, control of Azerbaijan. Uh, and sort of that, that was a new development as a result mm -hmm. of the war. Uh, and so Kocharyan is is implying, not really, not really explaining how he plans to get there, other than his standing uh, with the with the players okay. around the table. Uh, Alson uh, Haryatyan in uh, Washington D.C. Uh, earlier, Harut over in Yerevan did mention uh, the global uh, political scene and their attitude to the war. There was a noticeable silence or a sort of acceptance of what was going, verbal condemnation of what was uh, of the conflict itself, but not much more from the US, not much more from the EU, as if, you know, we need this to play out and get it over one thing for all, because, you know, we're not going to get involved in the Caucasus, let Russia and Turkey sort it out. Is that the sort of general impression you got? <clears throat> well, we have to bear in mind that the war was happening under a different administration in Washington. Uh, the Trump administration, which had very different type of relations with Turkey and with Russia, number one. Number two, the overall U.S. foreign policy, whatever it was under the Trump administration, I think it was quite an ambiguous one, but was about disengagement from many regions, including the Middle East and the Caucasus and elsewhere. So uh, the silence or whatever, uh, I think, among other things, definitely uh, was because of the different political administration here. Uh, as soon as the power changed in America, and I think that's part of the reason why the timing of this attack by Azerbaijan and Turkey was picked. It was right the election time, it was the, uh, it was the campaign period, nobody really was going to be very uh, active in foreign policy. And, and of course the pandemic and many other factors that played in, in the timing of when this attack happened. So I think that was very cal carefully calculated. As for EU, um, I do think that the EU had, could have done much more. Uh, there were several um, uh, statements by the European Parliament and others, but it was mostly of the humanitarian nature. When it comes to the international law and other aspects, I think um, we have, we, we Armenians, first of all, probably have to go back and retrospectively analyze where did we go wrong with what we were talking or doing with regards to Nagorno-Karabakh. And not only Pashinyan administration, but the predecessors as well. Uh, one quick comment on Robert Kocharyan. Um, uh, agreed uh, with Harut on, on uh, oh yeah, I'm going to, it's all going to be okay, but also uh, very clearly talking about deeper level of integration with Russia, whatever that means. Um, and, and, and just quick facts. I mean, yesterday at his rally, quite a large rally, uh, and a, 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 the, the, if you wish, a, a demonstration of power, you could see a lot of Russian flags. So uh, nobody is hiding from uh, whoever. And I think our colleague uh, from Russia has been talking about a second tour. It's interesting that uh, uh, I would like to hear why he thinks there will be a second tour, although uh, okay. it's the second round of elections. It might very well be. Uh, but it's interesting how how all, all of the, I mean, pretty much every party that has a chance to get into the parliament uh, has not been doubting the overall strategic nature of Armenia-Russia relations. Okay. It's about how we're going to move forward after this and what are the lessons learned, especially after the devastating war that we had last year. OK, we are coming to the end of the programme. Final question, really, to Harut uh, Manoukian in uh, Yerevan. Very quickly, sir, can this election draw a line under the issues uh, and can one candidate really offer long-term peace and prosperity that the public in Armenia so dearly deserve? Uh, I think the, the most important aspect of the election is going to be uh, the concession uh, by whoever does not win. Uh, and it's not clear at this point uh, who, that's, who that's going to be. Uh, but in past elections, uh, we've often seen in Armenia a lot of post-election protests. Uh, and that kind of instability uh, mm -hmm. might draw out 
political issues and instability. And uh, my hope is that uh, the electoral system, as Vladimir mentioned, there is this uh, ability to have a second round. Uh, there will be a majority ensured at some point. Uh, it might take until July 18 for that to happen. Well, we shall see what happens. For the moment, we have to leave it there. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, Harut Manugian in uh, Yerevan, Vladimir Sotnikov in Moscow and Arsene Haryatyan in Washington, D.C. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. And, of course, thank you for watching as well. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sahil Rahman, and the Inside Story team, thanks very much for your time and your company.